It has pages. <laughs> Mine oh. has no pages. So it's like. <laughs> But, um, mine is an old tablet. <laughs> mine has the time, the date, the reading speed, the page numbers, more than I'd ever want to know. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's time. It's five o'clock. Shall we oh, pray? Seven o'clock. Seven o'clock. Sorry, George. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to call time from where we're at. <laughs> no, we're, we're the minority here, I guess. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Even saying it's on our time. <laughs> Chris will get on and he'll be the same as us now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. Okay. Anyway, anyway, folks, <laughs> let's, let's pray. Wait a minute. Oh, I Hello. thought you said we're live. No. Okay, what are you doing there? So Hello. Chris has moved in, Sandy? Yes, he has. Oh, good. All right. Now we're ready? Okay. Heavenly Father, once again, we're so blessed to be able to come and study and read and learn. And we just pray the Holy Spirit to guide us in, in this study and uh, we can we can glean little things little tidbits and treasures that uh, we can share with others so they can have fine peace and comfort in, in your word so just be with us as we study thank you so much for your son Yeshua died for us in his name we pray amen okay people who's first when Saul departed early next morning the prophet went forth with him Having passed through the town, he directed the servant to go forward. Then he bade Saul stand still to receive a message sent him from God. Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him and said, Is it not because Jehovah hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? As evidence that his, this was done by divine authority, he foretold the incidents that would occur on the homeward journey and assured Saul that he would be qualified by the Spirit of God for the station awaiting him. The Spirit of Jehovah will come upon thee, said the prophet, and thou shalt be turned into another man, and let it be, when these signs are come unto thee, that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. As Saul went on his way, all came to pass as the prophet had said. Near the border of Benjamin, he was informed that the lost animals had been found. In the plain of Tabor, he met three men who were going to worship God at Bethel. One of them carried three kids for sacrifice, another three loaves of bread, and the third a bottle of wine for the sacrificial feast. They gave Saul the usual salutation and also presented him with two of the three loaves of bread. At Gabeah, his own city, a band of prophets returning from the high place were singing the praise of God to the music of the pipe and the harp, the psaltery and the tabret. As Saul approached them, the spirit of the Lord came upon him also, and he joined in their song of praise and prophesied with them. He spoke with so great fluency and wisdom and joined so earnestly in the service that those who had known him exclaimed in astonishment, what is this that has come into the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? As Saul united with the prophets in their worship, a great change was wrought in him by the Holy Spirit. The light of divine purity and holiness shone in upon the darkness of the natural heart. He saw himself as he was before God. He saw the beauty of holiness. He was now called to begin the warfare against sin and Satan. He was made to feel that in this conflict, his strength must come wholly from God. The plan of salvation, which had before seemed dim and uncertain, was open to his understanding. The Lord endowed him with courage and wisdom for his high station. 
He revealed to him the source of strength and grace and enlightened his understanding as to the divine claims and his own duty. The anointing of Saul as king had not been made known to the nation. The choice of God was to be publicly manifested by lot. For this purpose, Samuel convoked the people at Mizpah. Prayer was offered for divine guidance, then followed the solemn ceremony of casting the lot. In silence, the assembled multitude awaited the issue. The tribe, the family, and the household were successively designated. And then Saul, the son of Kish, was pointed out as the individual chosen. But Saul was not in the assembly. Burdened with a sense of the great responsibility about to fall upon him, he had secretly withdrawn. He was brought back to the congregation, who observed with pride and satisfaction that he was kingly bearing and noble form being higher than any of the people from his shoulders and upward. Even Samuel, when presenting him to the assembly, exclaimed, See ye him whom the Lord hath chosen, that there is none like him among all the people. And in response arose from the vast throng one long, loud shout of joy. God save the king. Samuel then set before the people the manner of the kingdom, stating the principles on which the monarchical government was based and by which it should be controlled. The king was not to be an absolute monarch, but was to hold his power in subjection to the will of the Most High. This address was recorded in a book, wherein were set forth the prerogatives of the prince and the rights and privileges of the people. Though the nation had despised Samuel's warning, the faithful prophet, while forced to yield to their desires, still endeavored as far as possible to guard their liberties. While the people in general were ready to acknowledge Saul as their king, there was a large party in opposition. For a monarch to be chosen from Benjamin, the smallest of the tribes of Israel, and that to the neglect of both Judah and Ephraim, the largest and most powerful, was a slight which they could not brook. They refused to profess allegiance to Saul or to bring him the customary presence. Those who had been most urgent in their demand for a king were the very ones that refused to accept with gratitude the man of God's appointment. The members of each faction had their favorite, whom they wished to see placed on the throne, and several among the leaders had desired the honor for themselves. Envy and jealousy burned in the hearts of many. The efforts of pride and ambition had resulted in disappointment and discontent. Okay, Carol. Carol? Okay. In this condition of affairs, Saul did not see fit to assume the royal dignity. Leaving Samuel to administer the government as formerly, he returned to Gibeah. He was honorably escorted thither by a company who, seeing the divine choice of his selection, was, were determined to sustain him. But he made no attempt to maintain by force his right to the throne. In his home among the uplands of Benjamin, he quietly occupied himself in the duties of a husbandman, leaving the establishment of his authority entirely to God. Soon after Saul's appointment, the Amorites, under their king, Nanush, invaded the territory of the tribe east of Jordan and threatened the city of Jabesh Gilead. The inhabitants tried to secure terms of peace by offering to become tributary to the Amorites. To this, the cruel king would not consent, but on condition that he might put out the right eye of every one of them, thus making them abiding witnesses to his power. The people of the besieged city begged a respite of seven days. To this, the Amorites consented. Thinking thus to heighten the honor of their expected triumph, messengers were at once dispatched to 
Jabesh to seek help from the tribes west of Jordan. They carried the tidings for to Gibeah, creating, creating widespread terror. Saul, returning at night from following the oxen in the field, heard the loud wail that told of some great calamity. He said, what aileth the people that they weep when the when the uh, shameful story was repeated, all his dormant powers were aroused. The spirit of God came upon Saul and he took a yoke of oxen and hewed them in pieces and sent them throughout all the coasts of Israel by the hands of messengers saying, whosoever come not forth after Saul and after Samuel, so shall it be done unto his oxen. 330,000 men gathered on the plain of Bezek under the command of Saul. Messengers went immediately sent, were sent, immediately sent to the besieged city with the assurance that they were they might expect help on the morrow, the, the very day on which they were to submit to the Amorites. By a rapid night march, Saul and his army crossed the Jordan and arrived before Jabesh in the morning watch, like Gibeon, dividing his force into three companies. He fell upon the Amorite camp at that early hour when not suspecting danger, they were least secure. In the panic that followed, they were routed, routed with great slaughter and they which remained were scattered so that two of them were not left together. The promptness and bravery of Saul, as well as the generalship shown in the successful conduct of so large a force, were qualities which the people of Israel had desired in a monarch, that they might be able to cope with another nation. They now greeted him as their king, attributing the honor of the victory to human agencies and forgetting that without God's special blessing, all their efforts would have been in vain. In their enthusiasm, some proposed to put to death those who had at first refused to acknowledge the authority of Saul. But the king interfered saying, there shall not man be put to death this day, for today the Lord has wrought salvation in Israel. Here Saul gave evidence of the change that had taken place in his character. And stay, instead of taking honor to himself, he gave the glory to God. Instead of showing a desire for revenge, he manifested a spirit of compassion and forgiveness. This is unmistakable evidence that the grace of God dwells in the heart. Samuel now proposed that the National Assembly should be convoked convoked at Gibeah that the kingdom might there be publicly confirmed to Saul. It was done and there were, and there they sacrificed sacrifices of peace offerings before the Lord. And then saw, and there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. Gilgal had been the place of Israel's first encampment in the promised land. It was here that Joshua, by divine direction, set up the pillar of 12 stones to commemorate the miraculous passage of the Jordan. Here, circumcision had been renewed. Here, they had kept the first Passover after the sin at Kadesh and the desert sojourn. Here, the man had ceased. Here, the captain of the Lord's host had revealed himself as chief, chief in command of the Lord's host. Okay, I got caught carried away here. Had revealed himself to the chief in command of the armies of Israel. From this place, they marched to the overthrow at Jericho and the conquest of Ai. Here, Achan met the penalty of his sin, and here was made the treaty with the Gibeonites, which punished Israel's neglect to ask counsel of God. Upon this plain, 
linked with so many thrilling associations, said Samuel and Saul. And when the shouts of welcome to the king had died away, the, the aged prophet gave his parting words as ruler of the nation. Behold, he said, I have hearkened unto your voice and all that ye have said unto me and have made a king over you. And now behold, the king walketh before you and I, and I am old and gray headed and I have walked before you from it, my childhood unto this day. Behold, here I am witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Or whose ass have I taken? Or whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? Or of whose hand have I received any bribe to blind mine eyes therewith? Okay, George. Will restore it you. Yeah. With what voice the people answered, Thou hast not defrauded us nor oppressed us, neither hast thou taken aught of any man's hand. Samuel was not seeking merely to justify his own course. He had previously set forth the principles that should govern both the king and the people, and he desired to add to his words the weight of his own example. From childhood, he had been connected with the work of God, and during his long life, one object had been ever before him, the glory of God and the highest good of Israel. Before there could be any hope of prosperity for Israel, they must be led to repentance before God. In consequence of sin, they had lost their faith in God and their discernment of his power and wisdom to rule the nation, lost their confidence in his ability to vindicate his cause. Before they could find true peace, they must be led to see and confess the very sin of which they had been guilty. They had declared the object of the demand for a king to be that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Samuel recounted the history of Israel from the day when God brought them from Egypt. Jehovah, the king of kings, had gone out before them and had fought their battles, offered their sins and sold them into the power of their enemies. But no sooner did they turn from their evil ways than God's mercy raised up a deliverer. The Lord said Gideon and Barak and Jephthah and Samuel had delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side, and he dwelt safe. Yet when threatened with, a, with danger, they had declared, a king shall reign over us. What said the prophet, Jehovah your God was your king. Now therefore continued Samuel, stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Is it not wheat harvest today? I will call unto the Lord, and he shall send thunder and rain that ye may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, which ye have done in the sight of the Lord, and asking you a king. So Samuel called unto the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day. At the time of wheat harvest in May and June, no rain fell in the east. The sky was cloudless and the air serene and mild. So violent a storm at this season filled all hearts with fear. In humiliation, the people now confessed their sin the very sin of which they had been guilty. Pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God, that we die not, for we have added unto all our sins this evil, to ask us for a king. To ask us a king. Samuel did not leave the people in a state of discouragement, for this would have prevented all effort for a better life. Satan would lead them to look upon God as severe and unforgiving. They would thus be exposed to manifold temptations. God is merciful and forgiving, ever desiring to show favor to his people when they will obey his voice. Fear not was the message of God by his servant. He have done all this wickedness, yet turned not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart, and turn ye not aside, for then should ye go after vain things, which cannot profit nor deliver, for they are vain. For the Lord will not forsake his people. Samuel said nothing of the slight which had been put upon himself. He uttered no reproach for the ingratitude with which Israel had repaid his lifelong devotion, but he assured them of his unceasing interest for them. God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. 
Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider how great things he hath done for you. But if ye shall still do wickedly, ye shall be consumed, both ye and your king. Presumption of Saul. After the assembly at Gilgal, Saul disbanded the army that had in his call arisen to overthrow the Ammonites, reserving only 2,000 men to be stationed under his command at Michmash and 1,000 to attend his son, Jonathan at Gibeon. Here was a serious error. His army was filled with hope and courage by the recent victory, and had he proceeded at once against another enemy of Israel, a telling blow might have been struck for the liberties of the nation. Meanwhile, their warlike neighbors, the Philistines, were active. After the defeat at Ebenezer, they had still retained possession of some hill fortresses in the land of Israel. But now they established themselves in the very heart of the country. In facilities, arms, and equipments of the Philistines had great advantage over Israel. During the long period of their oppressive rule, they had endeavored to strengthen their power by forbidding the Israelites to practice the trade of smiths lest they should make weapons of war. After the conclusion of peace, the Hebrews had still resorted to the Philistine garrisons for such work as needed to be done. Controlled by love of ease and the abject spirit induced by long oppression, the men of Israel had, to a great extent, neglected to provide themselves with the weapons of war. Bows and slings were used in warfare, and these the Israelites could obtain. But there were none among them except Saul and his son Jonathan, who possessed a spear or a sword. It was not until the second year of Saul's reign that an attempt was made to subdue the Philistines. The first blow was struck by Jonathan, the king's son, who attacked and overcame their garrison at Geba. The Philistines, exasperated by this defeat, made ready for a speedy attack upon Israel. Saul now caused war to be proclaimed by the sound of the trumpet throughout the land, calling upon all the men of war including the tribes across the Jordan, the assemble at Gilgal. Okay, this Bart. summons was obeyed. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Joe. The Philistines had gathered an immense force at Big Mash, 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and people as the sand which was on the seashore multitude. When the tidings reached Saul and his army at Gilgal, the people were appalled at the thought of the mighty forces they would have to encounter in battle. They were not prepared to meet the enemy, and many were so terrified that they dared not come to the test of an encounter. Some crossed the Jordan, while others hid themselves in caves and pits and above the rocks that abounded in that region. As the time for the encounter drew near, the number of desertions rapidly increased, and those who did not withdraw from the ranks were filled with foreboding and terror. Okay, Barbara. When Saul was first anointed king of Israel, he had received from Samuel explicit directions concerning the course to be pursued at this time. Thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal, said the prophet, and behold, I will come down unto thee to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days shalt thou tarry till I come to thee and show thee what thou shalt do. Day after day, Saul tarried, but without making decided efforts toward encouraging the people and inspiring confidence in Yehovah. Before the time appointed by the prophet had fully expired, he became impatient at the delay and allowed himself to be discouraged by the trying circ circumstances that surrounded him. Instead of faithfully seeking to prepare the people for the service that Samuel was coming to perform, he indulged in unbelief and foreboding. The work of seeking Yehovah by sacrifice was a most solemn and important work, and Yehovah required that his people should search their hearts and repent of their sins, that the offerings might be made with acceptance before him and that his blessings might attend their efforts to conquer the enemy. But Saul had grown real restless, and the people, instead of trusting in Yehovah for help, were looking to the king whom they had chosen to lead and direct them. 
Yet the Lord still cared for them and did not give them up to the disasters that would have come upon them if the frail arm of flesh had become their only support. He brought them into close places that they might be convicted of the folly of, folly of depending on man and that they might turn to him as their only help. The time for the proving of Saul had come. He was now to show whether or not he would depend on Yahovah and patiently wait according to his command, thus revealing himself as one whom God could trust in trying places as the ruler of his people, or whether he would be vacillating and unworthy of the sacred responsibility that had devolved upon him. Would the king whom Israel had chosen listen to the ruler of all kings? Would he turn the attention of their his faint-hearted soldiers to the one in whom is everlasting strength and deliverance? With growing impatience, he awaited the arrival of Samuel and attributed the confusion and distress and desertion of his army to the absence of the prophet. The appointed time came, but the man of God did not immediately appear. God's providence had detained his servant, but Saul's restless, impulsive spirit would no longer be restrained. Feeling that something must be done to calm the fears of the people, he determined to summon an assembly for religious service and by sacrifice entreat the divine aid. God had directed that only those consecrated to the office should present sacrifices before him. But Saul commanded, bring hither a burnt offering. And equipped as he was with armor and weapons of war, he approached the altar and offered sacrifice before Yehovah. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. Samuel saw at once that Saul had gone contrary to the express directions that had been given him. The Lord had spoken by his prophet that at this time he would reveal what Israel must do in this crisis. If Saul had fulfilled the conditions upon which divine help was promised, the Lord would have wrought a marvelous deliverance for Israel with the few who were loyal to the king. But Saul was so well satisfied with himself and his work that he went out to meet the prophet as one who should be commended rather than disapproved. Samuel's countenance was full of anxiety and trouble. But to his inquiry, what hast thou done? Saul offered excuse for his presumptuous act. He said, I saw that the people were scattered from me and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash. Therefore, said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me at Gilgal, and I have not made supplication to the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. Gee, he sacrificed and forced himself. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> and Samuel said to Saul, <clears throat> Thou hast done foolishly, thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever, but now the kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people. And Samuel arose and got him up from Gilgal unto Gil. Gilbia of Benjamin. Hey, Keith. You're muted. What, a, what about uh, Linda? She's oh, after that's... Keith. Oh, she generally comes before him. Where are oh. we at? Either Israel. Do you want to read next, Linda? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. 621? 621. Either Israel must cease. It says... Either Israel must cease, that, that's it? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Either Israel must cease to be the people of God or the principle upon which the monarchy was founded must be maintained. 
and the nation that must be governed by a divine power. If Israel would be wholly the Lord's, if the will of the human and earthly were held in subjection to the will of God, he would continue to be the, the ruler of Israel. So long as the king and the people would conduct themselves as subordinates to God, so long as he could be their defense. But in Israel, no monarchy could prosper that did not in all things acknowledge the supreme authority of God. If Saul had shown a regard for the requirements of of God in this time of trial, God would have worked his will through him. His failure now proved him unfit to be the vicegerent of God to his people. He would mislead Israel. His will, rather than the will of God, would be the controlling power. If Saul had been faithful, his kingdom would have been established forever. But since he had failed, the purpose of God must be accomplished by another. The government of Israel must be committed to one who would rule the people according to the will of heaven. We do not know what great interest may be at stake in the proving of God. There is no safety except in strict obedience to the word of God. All his promises are made upon condition of faith and obedience and a failure to comply with his commands cut off the fulfillment to us of the rich provisions of the scripture. We should not follow impulse nor rely on the judgment of men. We should look to the revealed will of God and walk according to his definite, definite uh, commandments. No matter what circumstance may surround us, God will take care of the results. By faithfulness his, to his word, we may, in time of trial, prove before men and angels that the Lord can trust us in difficult places to carry out his will, honor his name, and bless his people. Saul was in disfavor with God, and yet unwilling to humble his heart in penitence. What he lacked in real Piety, he would try to make up by his zeal and the forms of religion. Saul was not ignorant of Israel's defeat when the Ark of God was brought into the camp by Hopni and Finus. And yet, knowing all of this, he determined to send for the sacred chest and its attendant priests. Could he, by this means, inspire confidence in the people? He hoped to reassemble his scattered army and give battle to the Philistines. He would now dispense with Samuel's presence and support and thus free himself from the prophet's unwelcome uh, crit criticisms and reproofs. The Holy Spirit had been granted to Saul to enlighten his understanding and soften his heart. He had received faithful instructions and reproof from the prophet of God. And yet how great was his perversity. The history of, a, of Israel's first king presents a sad example of the power of earth of early wrong habits. In his youth, Saul did not love and fear God, and that impetuous spirit, not early trained to submission, was ever ready to rebel against divine authority. Those who in their youth cherish a sacred regard for the will of God and who faithfully perform the duties of their position will be prepared for higher service in afterlife. But men cannot for years prevent the power of God that God has given them. And then when they choose to change, find these powers fresh and free for an entirely opposite course. Saul's effort to arouse the people proved un, unavailing. Finding his force reduced to 600 men, he left Gilgal and retired to the fortress of Giba, lately taken from the Philistines. This stronghold was on the south side of a deep rugged valley or gorge a few miles north of the site of Jerusalem, on the north side of the same valley. Machmesh, the Philistine force, lay encamped 
while detachments of troops went out in different directions to ravage the country. God had permitted matters to be thus brought to a crisis that he might rebuke the perversity of Saul and teach his people a lesson of humility and faith. Because of Saul's sin in his presumptuous offering, the Lord would not give him the honor of vanquishing the Philistines. Jonathan, the king's son, a man who feared the Lord, was chosen as the instrument to deliver Israel. Moved by a divine impulse, he proposed to his armor bearer that they should make a secret attack upon the enemy's camp. It may be, he urged, that the Lord will work for us. For there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. The armor bearer, who also was a man of faith and prayer, encouraged the design, and together they withdrew from the camp secretly, lest their purpose should be opposed. With earnest prayer to the guide of their fathers, they agreed upon a sign by which they might determine how to proceed. Then passing down into the gorge, separating the two armies, they silently threat, threaded their way under the shadow of the cliff and partially concealed by the mounds and ridges of the valley, approaching the Philistine fortress. They were revealed to the view of their enemies who said tauntingly, Behold, the Hebrews came forth out of the holes where they had hid themselves. They then challenged him, Come up to us, and we will show you a thing, meaning that they would punish the two Israelites for their daring. This challenge was taken that Jonathan and his companion had agreed to accept as evidence that the Lord would prosper their, their undertaking. Passing now from the sight of the Philistines, and choosing a secret and difficult path, the warriors made their way to the summit of a cliff that had been deemed inaccessible and was not very strongly guarded. Thus they penetrated the enemy's camp and slew the sentinels, who overcame with surprise and fear, offered no resistance. Okay. Angels Linda. of heaven. Linda. Angels of heaven shielded Jonathan and his attendant. Angels fought by their side, and the Philistines fell before them. The earth trembled as though a great multitude with horsemen and chariots were approaching. Jonathan recognized the tokens of divine aid, and even the Philistines knew that God was working for the deliverance of Israel. Great fear seized upon the host, both in the field and in the garrison. In the confusion, mistaking their own soldiers for enemies, the Philistines began to slay one another. Soon the noise of the battle was heard in the camp of Israel. The king's sentinels reported that there was great confusion among the Philistines and that their numbers were decreasing. Yet it was not known that any part of the Hebrew army had left the camp. Upon inquiry, it was found that none were absent except Jonathan and his armor bearer. But seeing that the Philistines were meeting with a repulse, Saul led his army to join the assault. The Hebrews who had deserted to the enemy now turned against them. Great numbers also came out of their hiding places. And as the Philistines fled, discomfited, Saul's army committed terrible havoc upon the fugitives. Determined to make the most of his advantage, the king rashly forbade his soldiers to partake of food for the entire day, enforcing his command by the solemn imprecation, Cursed be the man that eateth any food until evening that I may be avenged on mine enemies. The victory had already been gained without Saul's knowledge or cooperation, but he hoped to distinguish himself by the utter destruction of the vanquished enemy, army. The command to refrain from food was prompted by selfish ambition, and it showed the king to be indifferent to the needs of his people when these conflicted with his desire for self-exaltation. To confirm this prohibition by a solemn oath showed Saul to be both rash and profane. The very words of the curse gave evidence that Saul's zeal was for himself and not for the honor of God. He declared his object to be not that the Lord may be avenged on his enemies, but that I may be avenged on mine enemies. The prohibition resulted in leading the people to transgress the command of God. 
They had been engaged in warfare all day and were faint for want of food. And as soon as the hours of restriction were over, they fell upon the spoil and devoured the flesh with the blood, thus violating the law that forbade the eating of blood. During the day's battle, Jonathan, who had not heard of the king's command, unwittingly offended by eating a little honey as he passed through a wood. Saul learned of this at evening. He had declared that the violation of his edict should be punished with death. And though Jonathan had not been guilty of a willful sin, though God had miraculously preserved his life and had brought deliverance through him, the king declared that the sentence must be executed. To spare the life of his son would have been an acknowledgement on the part of Saul that he had sinned in making so rash a vow. This would have been humiliating to his pride. God do so and more also was his terrible sentence. Thou shalt surely die, Jonathan. Saul could not claim the honor of the victory, but he hoped to be honored for his zeal in maintaining the sacredness of his oath. Even at the sacrifice of his son, he would impress upon his subjects the fact that the royal authority must be maintained. At Gilgal, but a short time before, Saul had presumed to officiate as priest, contrary to the command of God. When reproved by Samuel, he had stubbornly justified himself. Now when his own command was disobeyed, through the command, though the command was unreasonable and had been violated through ignorance, the king and father sentenced his son to death. The people refused to allow the sentence to be executed. Braving the anger of the king, they declared, Shall Jonathan die, who hath wrought this great salvation in Israel? God forbid, as the Lord liveth, there shall not one hair of his head fall to the ground, for he hath wrought with God this day. The proud monarch dared not disregard this unanimous verdict, and the life of Jonathan was preserved. Saul could not but feel that his son was preferred before him, both by the people and by the Lord. Jonathan's deliverance was a severe reproof to the king's rashness. He felt a presentiment that his curses would return upon his own head. He did not longer continue the war with the Philistines, but returned to his home, moody and dissatisfied. Those who are most ready to excuse or justify themselves in sin are often most severe in judging and condemning others. Many, like Saul, bring upon themselves the displeasure of God, but they reject counsel and despise reproof. Even when convinced that the Lord is not with them, they refuse to see in themselves the cause of their trouble. They cherish a proud, boastful spirit while they indulge in cruel judgment or severe rebuke of others who are better than they. Well would it be for such self-constituted judges to ponder those words of Christ. With what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. Often those who are seeking to exalt themselves are brought into positions where their true character is revealed. So it was in the case of Saul. His own course convinced the people that kingly honor and authority were dearer to him than justice, mercy, or bene benevolence. Thus the people were led to see their error in rejecting the government that God had given them. They had exchanged the pious prophet whose prayers had brought down blessings for a king who in his blind zeal had prayed for a curse upon them. Had not the men of Israel interposed to save the life of Jonathan, Jonathan, their deliverer would have perished by the king's decree. With what misgivings must that people afterward have followed Saul's guidance? How bitter the thought that he had been placed upon the throne by their own act. The Lord bears long with the waywardness of men, and to all he grants opportunity to see and forsake their sins. But while he may seem to prosper those who disregard his will and despise his warnings, he will, in his own time, surely make manifest their folly. Okay, Marty. Am I, <clears throat> am I still too loud or? Okay. You seem good. Oh, okay. If I was still too loud, I was going to bypass. No, you're Okay. Saul rejected. Saul had failed to bear the test of faith in the trying situation at Gilgal. 
and had brought dishonor upon the service of God. But his heirs were not yet irretrievable, and the Lord would grant him another opportunity to learn the lesson of unquestioning faith in his word and obedience to his commands. When reproved by the prophet of Gilgal, Saul saw no great sin in the course he had pursued. He felt that he had been treated unjustly and endeavored to vindicate his actions and offered excuses for his error. From that time, he had little intercourse with the prophet. Samuel loved Saul as his own son, while Saul, bold and ardent in temper, had held the prophet in high regard, but he resented Samuel's rebuke and henceforth avoided him so far as possible. But the Lord sent his servant with another message to Saul. By obedience, he might still prove his fidelity to God and his worthiness to walk before Israel. Samuel came to the king and delivered the word of the Lord that the monarch might realize the importance of heeding the command Samuel expressly declared that he spoke by divine direction, by the same authority that he had called Saul to the throne. The prophet said, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have, and spare them not, but slay both men and women infant and suckling ox and sheep, camel and ass. The Amaleks had been the first to make war upon Israel in the wilderness, and for this sin, together with their defiance of God and their debasing idolatry, the Lord, through Moses, had pronounced sentence upon them. By divine direction, the history of their cruelty toward Israel had been recorded. With the command, thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven, thou shalt not forget it. Deut uh, for 400 years, the execution of this sentence had been deferred, but the Amalekites had not turned from their sins. The Lord knew that the wicked people would, if it were possible, blot out his people and his worship from the earth. Now the time had come for the sentence to so long delayed to be executed. The forbearance that God has exercised toward the wicked and boldens men in transgression. But their punishment will be nonetheless certain and terrible for being long delayed. The Lord shall rise up as in Mount Perizim. He shall be worth as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. To our merciful God, the act of punishment is a strange act. As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. The Lord is merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin. Yet he will by no means clear the guilty. While he does not delight in vengeance, he will execute judgment upon the transgressors of his law. He is forced to do this to preserve the inhabitants of the earth from utter depravity and ruin. In order to save some, he must cut off those who have become hardened in sin. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. By terrible things in righteousness, he will vindicate the authority of his downtrodden law. And the very fact of his reluctance to execute justice testifies to the enormity of the sins that call forth his judgments and to the severity of the retribution awaiting the transgressor but while inflicting judgment god remembered mercy the amalekites were to be destroyed but the kenites who dwelt among them were spared this people though not wholly free from idolatry 
were worshipers of God and were friendly to Israel. If this tribe was the brother-in-law to of this tribe was the brother-in-law of Moses, Hobab, who had accompanied the Israelites in their travels through the wilderness, and by his knowledge of the country had rendered them valuable assistance. Since the defeat of the Philistines at Michmash, Saul had made war against Moab, Ammon, and Edom, and against the Amalekites and the Philistines, and wherever he turned his arms, he gained fresh victories. On receiving the commission against the Amalekites, he at once proclaimed war to his own authority as added that of the prophet and all the call to battle, the men of Israel flocked to his standard. The expedition was not to be entered upon for the purpose of self aggrandizement the Israelites were not to receive either the honor of the conquest or the spoils of their enemies. They were to engage in the war solely as an act of obedience to God for the purpose of executing his judgment upon the Amalekites. God intended that all nations should behold the doom of that people that had defied his sovereignty and should mark that they were destroyed by the very people whom they had despised. Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to Shur, which is over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen, and of the fatlings, and the lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile and refused, that they destroyed utterly. This victory over the Amalekites was the most brilliant victory that Saul had ever gained, and it served to rekindle the pride of heart that was his greatest peril. The divine eadic devoting the enemies of God to utter destruction was but partially fulfilled. Ambitious to heighten the honor of his triumphal return by the presence of a royal captive, Saul ventured to imitate the customs of the nation around him and spared Agag, the fierce and warlike king of the Amalekites. The people reserved for themselves the finest of the flocks, herds, and beasts of burden, excusing their sin on the ground that the cattle were reserved to be offered as sacrifices to the Lord. It was their purpose, however, to use these merely as a substance to save their own cattle. Okay, my turn. Okay. (laughs) Saul had now been subjected to the final test. His presumptuous disregard of the will of God showing his determination to rule as an independent monarch, proved that he could not be trusted with royal power as the vice regent of the Lord. While Saul and his army were marching home in the flush of victory, there was deep anguish in the home of Samuel the prophet. He had received a message from the Lord, denouncing the course of the king. Repent me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. The prophet was deeply grieved over the course of the rebellious king, and he wept and prayed all night for reversing of the terrible sentence. God's repentance is not like man's repentance. The strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. Man's repentance implies a change of mind. God's repentance implies a change of circumstances and relations. Man may change his relation to God by complying with the conditions on on which he may be brought into the divine favor, or he may, by his own action, place him outside the favoring condition. But the Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Saul's disobedience changed his relation to God, but the conditions of acceptance with God were unaltered. God's requirements were still the same, for with him there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. With an aching heart, the prophet set forth the next morning to meet the erring king. Samuel cherished a hope that upon reflection, Saul might become conscious of his sin and by repentance 
and humiliation be restored to the divine favor. But when the first step is taken in the path of transgression, the way becomes easy. Saul, debased by his disobedience, came to meet Samuel with a lie upon his lips. He exclaimed, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. The sounds that fell on the prophet's ears disapproved the statement of the disobedient king. To the pointed question, What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears, and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Saul made answer, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. And the rest we have utterly destroyed. The people had obeyed Saul's directions, but in order to shield himself, he was willing to charge upon them the sin of his disobedience. The message of Saul's rejection brought unspeakable grief to the heart of Samuel. It had to be delivered before the whole army of Israel when they were filled with pride and triumphal rejoicing over a victory that was accredited to the valor and generalship of their king. For Saul had not associated God with the success of Israel in this conflict. But when the prophet saw the evidence of Saul's rebellion, he was stirred with indignation that he, who had been so highly favored of God, should transgress the commandment of heaven and lead Israel into sin. Samuel was not deceived by the subterfuge of the king. With mingled grief and indignation, he declared, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord has said to me this night. When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. He repeated the command of the Lord concerning Amalek and demanded the reason of the king's disobedience. Saul persisted in self-justification. Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and have gone the way which the Lord sent me and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should be utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. In stern and solemn words, the prophet swept away the subterfuge of lies and pronounced the irrevocable sentence. Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. As the king heard this faithful, fearful sentence, he cried out, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Hmm. Terrified by the denunciation of the prophet, Saul acknowledged his guilt, which he had before stubbornly denied. But he still persisted in casting blame upon the people, declaring that he had sinned through the fear of them. It was not sorrow for sin, but fear of its penalty that actuated the king of Israel as he entreated Samuel. I pray thee, pardon my sin and turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord. If Saul had had true repentance, he would have made public confession of his sin. But it was his chief anxiety to maintain his authority and retain the allegiance of the people. He desired the honor of Samuel's presence in order to strengthen his own influence with the nation. I will not return with thee, was the answer of the prophet, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. As Samuel turned to depart, the king, in an agony of fear, laid hold of his mantle to hold him back, but it rent in his hands. Upon this, the prophet declared, the Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. Saul was more disturbed by the alienation of Samuel than by the displeasure of God. He knew that people had greater confidence in the prophet than in himself. Should another by divine command be now anointed king, Saul felt that it would be impossible to maintain his own authority. He feared an immediate revolt should Samuel utterly forsake him. Saul entreated the prophet to honor him before the elders and the people by publicly uniting with him in a religious service. By divine direction, Samuel yielded to the king's request, but no occasion might be given for re revolt, but he remained only as a silent witness of the service. An act of justice, stern and terrible, was yet to be performed. Samuel must 
publicly vindicate the honor of God and rebuke the course of Saul. He commanded that the king of uh, the Amal Amalekites <clears throat> be brought before him. Above all who had fallen by the sword of Israel, Agag was the most guilty and merciless, one who had hated and sought to destroy the people of God and whose influence had been strongest to promote idolatry. He came at the prophet's command, flattering himself that the danger of death was past. Samuel declared, as thy sword hath made women childless, show so, so shall thy mother be childless among women. And Samuel hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord. This done, Samuel returned to his home in Ramah. Saul to his at Gil Gibeah, Gilbia. Only once thereafter did the prophet and the king ever meet each other. So why don't we stop there at six? Uh, straight up, we've got a couple more pages to go. I'd like to finish, but well, yeah. it's thirteen minutes. Yeah. Uh, some people might like to go to bed or eat supper. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we only like four pages to a, a yeah. chapter. Yeah. I just thought that'd be a good place to stop. And then we can find out what's going to happen because, yeah, we can have a little discuss what we already read because coming up is uh, bad news for Saul. <laughs> yeah. So uh, anyway, anyone have any comments? I don't, I don't see how you can, because your son did so, an ignorant sin, you're going to have him executed. I uh, know. Yeah. That's unbelievable. Well, Saul knew that he was doing wrong. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, well, the people wanted the king. They got what they asked for. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes you got to be careful what you ask for. You know, because sometimes you get it. But the thing of it is, in asking for a king, actually, they were rejecting God being ruler over them. Exactly. Right. That's what they said. He was mm -hmm. there. And he, he led them out of uh, Egypt and everything else. And now they want, hmm. want to be like everybody else. Don't want to be different. That's the problem, yeah. You know, well, they was told exactly what would happen to them if they chose a king. Mm -hmm. And to us today, what difference is it today? Yeah, those same things that they told them there is happening today. Oh yeah, taxes, taking your boys and putting them in the army, all of these regulations that paying, you know, all this stuff that uh, is ungodly is happening today also. Amen. Well, sometimes we fear other things rather than fear God. That's yeah. And look at the church. Who is the church entering to, the state or God? Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the Seventh-day Adventist church. Mm -hmm. Well, even those that are on uh, hey, the you. Internet, they fear uh, YouTube more than they fear God. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But we also aren't to put a target on ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. If you want, if you want to keep getting the word out there, you got to go by their rules. Well, I don't know. That's what that, that's what Saul did. Well, he made up the rules and went by their rules instead of God's. Well, what Christ do when, when they said, do you, the, uh, uh, said, shake it off and go to a different server. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but when they, when the, uh, Pharisees ask, does, does Christ not, pay taxes? not saying certain things isn't going against God. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Well, what what Christ do when they you said can, you people? can find things to say all the time and get in trouble anywhere you go, but it's not worth it. We want to spread the word, which we don't get in trouble for. Yeah. There is a safety. Time, there will be a time sometime in the future when that may become a necessity, but not today. How do you know it's not today? Because you can give the message today within the parameters. Yeah. Within whose parameters? Well, didn't Christ God. speak in parables? Christ spoke in parables. He didn't want to upset the government. 
see, we can talk about the Trinity and some of these other things and not be kicked off from YouTube. And some of the other things that some people get knocked off, everybody already knows that you're not supposed to be doing those things. Uh -huh. <laughs> and they aren't telling anybody anything new because everybody's trying to say it, but I don't think they're going to get anybody to heaven any sooner by telling them things. And I'm not mentioning a name because of those things because I don't want to get kicked off. But you know what they are. Yeah. Yeah, but the thing of it is, come what may, no matter what the government says you can or can't do, we cannot compromise. We have to stand true to God and what he says. Exactly. That's right. The standing well, that's true to him isn't saying things that get you kicked off. Yeah. That's sometimes it is. That that depends, well, Sandy, on whether God lead, whether God leads you to say it or not. Now, if God it will, you, it will yeah. later. But the things people are getting kicked off for saying certain things have nothing to do with heaven or not. They're just the health message. Has it got anything to do with it? There's, I know of a ministry that got kicked off for preaching the health message. Well, it depends on what their health message was and what they say. <laughs> right out of the spirit of prophecy. Yep. <laughs> yep. I don't know about that, but anyway.